So yeah, we had a, a bunch of, uh, we, we published the Google Moderator link and encouraged people from the community to, to ask us questions. And there are some, some great questions there, um, at least at the top of the list. And, uh, <laughs> and so uh, I thought I'd just kick it off, but what I'll do is actually like, read, the, read the question out and I'll get people who aren't me to answer the question. Because I think people are sick of hearing me answering these questions. So uh, question number one is from Tom Payne in Zurich. Um, and he says, anti-patterns arise in every language, especially new ones as people explore how features can be used and abused. What anti-patterns do you see in the Go community? And what are the more idiomatic approaches? Anyone? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh no, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Someone lost his microphone. <laughs> the, 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 the big anti-pattern that I see is too many packages. Um, and so, I, I think that packages should be at a granularity of like an idea, like HTTP is an idea. HTTP client isn't an idea, that's just part of it. So if, if we're talking about the any patterns that I see, it is not, n not, not structuring packages to be, to be bigger than they might be in other languages. Are you afraid of the internal mechanism being abused? I think I made myself pretty clear about that. Yeah, oh, I, I don't actually remember. <laughs> yeah, there was dissent. I forgot if it yeah, was Yeah, there was you. the great tension about yeah, the, then this I internal that. package thing. I was kind of against it as well because, you know, the, the, I always thought it was really nice with packages that, you know, you're forced to declare a public interface. And so you have to think about the API whenever you kind of put something in a package and export it. And that's, that's actually nice. Even if you never intend for anybody outside your project to use it, it still makes the code cleaner inside. And there's kind of this idea, this fear that I have that the internal mechanism will kind of give people carte blanche to just make disastrous, crappy internal interfaces. Um, do you think we would have made like the regex syntax package public before unless we had to? No, exactly not. And that's why I stopped caring about it. <laughs> <laughs> but Brad, Brad had a really good suggestion. He told me when we were in GoCon, because um, I, was, I was complaining that uh, now Juju had just grown a utils package and how how deeply I didn't like this idea. And Brad, Brad said that in Camry Store they do have those, but instead of having the utils package, it has to have a name for the thing that it does. Mm. So like you, you have the, I don't know, what are yeah. some examples? We have like four or five utils, but there's, you know, stir util or, you know, I don't yeah. know, num util or something, yeah. something. Because the, the idea of just having like a generic, general utils bucket, just everything ends up in there. And mm. We're talking about an anti-pattern. But I kind of don't want people to use those things. I'm just doing it to reduce code duplication of my code, so I would make that an internal package. But it was something about shaming people or making them kind of have to be totally upfront that I want to I want to make this yeah. this ugly utils package. Mm. Yeah, I actually gave a talk about naming um, at the meetup a few, couple of days ago, and um, <laughs> are you okay, Blake? And. Uh, uh, one of the points I made is that if you, you know, if you have a package named util or common or something like that, then you're doing it wrong. Well, it tends to grow dependencies on everything, and then anyone who depends on common ends up depending on the world, so. Yeah. yeah. Another anti-pattern, I would say, is large interfaces. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Actually, when I've seen that several places, and it's, it's tempting to just make one giant interface that contains everything, and... And that tends to go hand in hand with, with another anti-pattern, which is declaring an interface that has just all of the exported methods of your concrete type, yeah. and then unexporting the concrete type, and only returning the interface, even though there's only one implementation of that interface. Yeah, generally, I, yeah, I, I don't like when people return interfaces rather than re return, a, return a concrete type, and only de even only declare an interface if you accept that interface. Like, if you need to operate on that thing, like if you need an IO reader, need an IO writer, that's when you take an interface. We always just return a thing. And if it happens to implement an interface that someone cares about, they can make their own interface for it. So maybe your test defines an interface, or maybe your client wants to abstract over your concrete type or somebody else's concrete type. But um, yeah, overuse of interfaces is kind of gross sometimes. Next question. Next question. Good call. <laughs> 
you should be moderating this thing. Um, so there are, there are several dependency management tools for Go in the wild, e.g. GoDep, GPM, GoNads, whatever, the whole lot. Are there any plans to, to provide support for dependency management in Go? Like, I take it in the core. Like, what's the Go team take on this problem? Um, no. I, I think I was telling somebody, <laughs> like, nobody on the Go team really wants to do this. We, we have our own system inside Google, and it's painful enough. And we don't really want to write the code or dictate a policy. So we were kind of hoping that the community will fight it out, and a victor will emerge. And then if everyone is happy, be with that Victor, like, you know, maybe it's yours. Um, maybe that is blessed as the de facto way. Maybe it starts as being blessed in the fact, being like, just go use GoDep. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe one day after, like, it's been stable for a couple years and everyone is universally happy with it, maybe then we put it in the core. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty difficult for us, like, on the Go team to really approach this problem because it's not a problem that we really have. Um, ourselves because we have our own problems that are not your problems and you should be grateful for that um, and so you know like we just don't have the perspective to solve it for everyone else um, which is maybe maybe a failing I don't know but Keith actually had an interesting proposal which I haven't had time to absorb because it came out like a couple of days ago um, but basically to kind of push some of the go depth stuff into the go tool maybe you can briefly explain what that external was external packages yeah, it, well, the idea was to have the Go tool, basically to give the Go tool an extra place to look for packages if there's a directory named external, to add, effectively add that to your Go path, search path, when it's looking for packages, so that, uh, so that any given command can carry its dependencies along with it without having to do the, the, the gnarly rewriting import statements that I was crowing about earlier that GoDep does. And it would kind of create like a, a pseudo go path inside, yeah. I think it's, it's worth mentioning that part of the reason we don't care so much inside Google is we don't actually use the Go tool. We have to use Google's, you know, monolithic, gigantic, weird, custom-grown build system to do everything. So, like, we actually like working in the open source world when we can use the nice, simple, fast Go tool instead of our thing. So. Yeah, and and also like. Like even the suggestion that, that I made a couple of days ago, it's not clear that that's a good idea, and it's not clear that the way GoDep does things today is is going to be like the end game of like the the best way to do it. Um, I think we're still all collectively figuring out what that is, um, and so it's premature to say that that any one of these tools should be blessed as the official thing. I'd I'd rather I'd rather wait and like what you were describing, I'd rather wait and, until one of them has been stable long enough and popular enough that, it, that it's more obvious that that's really what we want. Yeah, I mean, I will say that I'm, I'm pleased that, you know, the lack of versioning, and I know this sounds like a ridiculous excuse, but I'm pleased that, um, you know, the fact that there isn't versioning built into the Go tool means that people who are serious about providing like libraries for other people to use have to be really careful to maintain stable APIs. And you know, that's not just like about versions, it's also just about good software development, software engineering. You want to keep your clients happy, um, and that means stability. And so, you know, I've, I've that, personally found that I have personal projects that depend on a whole bunch of of other people's packages, and they haven't just dis just broken on me. It hasn't happened to me. I know it's happened to other people, but it hasn't happened to me. But if you're doing anything halfway <laughs> serious, halfway in production, you should definitely use do vendoring. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, that means using a tool, even though we're not going to tell you which one, or doing it yourself, which is what I always did. Uh, Camly Store has always vendored all its stuff, and it was just I had manual rsyncs and sed things and Perl things, and I just kind of like rewrote the imports by hand, which was a little trashy, but it worked. So, uh, next question was, what would a 2.0 version of Go fundamentally change? Um, I'm inclined to not answer this question. It's, it's well, yeah, I don't know. I think know. it's covered. Yeah, I think next. it's been talked about. Next. <laughs> next question. Um, okay, Go is a lovely language and, a f and fantastic for writing servers on Unix-like OSs. Consequently, people would like to use it in other areas, e.g. desktop apps and low memory embedded systems. How do you see Go evolving or compromising to embrace this diversity? My garage door opener runs Go. 
<laughs> yeah, and um, and Josh Blake Snyder gave a great talk about the beacon. PayPal, be the PayPal beacon device, which is a small ARM system, which is all running Go on the inside. I mean, I think as the definition of of low end embedded becomes bigger, <laughs> um, Go is more well suited to the to the to the platform. I mean, Dave has a lot of experience with these kind of systems. Yeah. Um, I'd really like to see go on some of the smaller ARM processors. Um, there are some, like, some technical challenges, like we have to make the compiler generate the kind of, kind of flavor of, of ARM code that is acceptable to those. And that, that's pretty straightforward. The, the other part is obviously a garbage collected language like needs space to do its bookkeeping. But we've, we've solved those problems before with the tiny, the old tiny OS. Um, so I, 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 like, that's something I really want to see. Maybe I, I definitely will happen after the compiler's rewritten, because mm. making, making, making it produce thumb code by default um, uh, would just be wasted effort at this point. Mm -hmm. About desktop stuff, haven't people written dozens of libraries for doing yeah. desktop? Yeah, uh, there's QML. Like yeah, like there's, there's, there's been many like GUI libraries. Unfortunately, the sad story of GUI libraries is they're mostly pretty bad, and it's not the fault of the people doing the bindings and stuff. It's more that it's either, if you're, write, you're writing it from scratch, you're designing your own GUI library, and that's colossal effort. Or you're wrapping some other like C++ based library, and that's kind of bound to be awful. And so it's, it's just a really difficult problem um, to solve. I personally would love to see like a really nice um, idiomatic Go um, GUI library, and I know that there are some. Um, yeah. But, uh, is anyone in the audience working on one? I know that um, Antoine, I don't, sorry, I can't remember his last name, has got Go UI. Um, there, there, there are plenty of, um, plenty of people trying to do this, and I think uh, part, of the problem, part of the problem is the requirements of talking to the, the graphics stack. You have to be on one thread. You mm -hmm. have to deal with all their kind of uh, thread injection stuff that they, they do. It's just an unfriendly yeah. environment to work in. But Gustavo Niemeyer's GoQML package is actually one of the, the nicer ones that I've used. But the unfortunate thing is that QML itself is this huge, and, Q, and Qt, which is like Nokia's cross-platform GUI toolkit, is this whole another thing to learn. And then you're trying to learn it in the context of this experimental new library for Go. And so there's a real kind of documentation gap, I feel. To, to I don't really think I could ever get it to install. I managed to get it to install. It, it took me filing some issues and pull requests and stuff to make it happen. But, but you know, it's, it's, uh, I was trying to do it on a Mac, so it was doubly difficult. On Linux, it actually worked really well, apparently. Um, yeah, there's also another solution for building apps on the desktop that I saw, and I thought it, at the beginning that it was kind of hacky, but it turns out to work really well, which is basically you write your code in Go, and you either embed a version of Chrome, or it's just just uh, start the, the browser. And that's pretty much what the GoTor does when you run it locally. It works really well, so. Yeah, that's what my audio synthesizer does as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it just uh, spawns your browser and then you have a WebSocket connection to the back end. And the back end's doing all this audio processing. The back end talks to the sound card via port audio um, and port MIDI and so on. But the actual GUI is JavaScript, um, which makes me really sad. <laughs> and. It's pretty much why I haven't worked on it in a long time. Um, because every time I go to implement a feature, I have to write JavaScript code, and I hate my life again. Um, <laughs> but um, maybe uh, now that I should, I should give it a try with uh, TARDIS, TARDIS Go or GoJS, and that might be a, a better option. Um, so relatedly, the next question is, can you give us an update on the Go support for Android? Um, yes, I can. <laughs> um, the, the, um, so uh, David Crawshaw is, is the man who has been um, sort of pushing this effort forward. He's based, uh, he's on the Go team and based in New York. Um, and he was actually out in Sydney the week before I came over here for this conference. And he's basically what he has at this point um, uh, a couple of different ways of running Go code as part of Android. One of them is you're, you're basically an NDK application, so you can have access to a canvas. Um, and touch events and sound, and you can uh, basically use OpenGL to program like games. Um, that's basically what it's for. Um, and the view is to sort of flesh this out 
Um, he's working on a 2D um, sprite library with Nigel Tau, who did the Go image packages, um, so that it'll be really easy to write nice um, games in Go for Android. Um, and we're hoping that with 1.4, the, the 1.4 release, that kind of stuff will be ready for people to start playing with. Um, the other mode of operation for that project, the Go mobile project, is um, being able to link Go objects into um, uh, Java apps. So you can have your Android app written in Java, and then you can have all of your kind of interesting networky stuff or you know whatever kind of interesting processing you don't want to write in Java. Um, you can do it in Go, and it creates a nice little um, uh, interface uh, in Java to talk to the Go code. Um, and is there another, another flavor of, of this? That's the main one. I think those are the main two. Um, but the interesting thing about the, the, the NDK style like game, game mode is that we, we hope that it will be the same APIs and the same process for doing it on iOS as well. Actually, for both, both modes. I think he wants the oh, APIs right. for the full screen mode to be the exact same APIs on iOS. Right. And for the embedding thing, he, so right now you write a Go package of like the API you want to call from Java, and it generates auto-generated Java that does all the marshalling of crap through to Go, and he's just going to generate Objective C or Swift or whatever when he wants to do the same thing on iOS. So, so yeah, that's actually that's really exciting. Um, I have a lot of game ideas, and that would be something I would actually really love to hack on. Next question: Do you consider Go's garbage collector production ready for long-running latency-sensitive processes? If so, great. If not, what's the plan of action? <coughs> um, people with experience with long-running, low-latency processes. The, the dl.google.com server, like, if you're careful with your garbage, which, I mean, in Go, you can actually be really careful with your garbage to not generate it, as opposed to languages like Java, where just, like, it always is generating garbage. So the, the <laughs> anyway, no, it's really true, because Go, Java doesn't give you control over memory layout. So to do anything, you're generating little boxes and little boxes all over the place. Um, and also a lot of the APIs aren't designed, like the yeah, low they, level ones aren't designed. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in Go it's more common, sometimes you bring your own buffer and supply it to somewhere, where in Java a lot of times the APIs just allocate, they, they assume it's cheap and it kind of is and it's okay, but um, yeah, so the, the download uh, dl.google.com server, I remember it was doing a GC like every couple seconds and it was generating like gigabytes of garbage all the time. And now it, I think it does one every like 90 seconds or so. And it skips most of the, most of the memory in the heap is just byte slices. So the garbage collector skips all those anyway. And so the, the pauses are minimal. Yeah, I mean the GC pauses are really contingent on a lot of different factors. You know, the size of the heap obviously matters. What kind of objects are in your heap matter. Um, you know, how much garbage you're actively generating. You know, so I think we've only really had like one customer inside Google that came to us with some really hard latency requirements that we told them like, no, we actually can't do that now, go away. I mean, we didn't tell them go away, we said, I'm sorry, we're working on it. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, they basically went away because we, they were doing some like real time bidding sort of ad thing. And um, if we didn't, you know, if, if we couldn't guarantee some like five millisecond at, you know, 99 something something percentile, then uh, then all their thing would just break, or they would lose money or something. So um, we don't know anything about making money. I, yeah, I there, are, there are very few people that have these, that, those kinds of requirements, though. So but I think hopefully in 1.5 and 1.6, the garbage collector with a concurrent garbage collector will get a lot better. And so. Cool. Uh, is there any update on the topic of dynamically loadable code similar to DLopen? Uh, I would say yes, there is. Ian's doc. Yeah. Uh, Ian Lance Taylor, who, who's the author of GCC Go and member, long time member of the Go team, he wrote a document um, in, within the last few months um, about Go execution modes. Um, you know, basically different contexts in which Go code could maybe run, and basically a plan for how those things might be achieved. And among those is like Go as a shared library, um, Go programs that load other bits of Go as shared libraries and all the kind of different permutations of these ideas. Um, and it talks about like what would need to be done to make that happen, um, but as far as like when that will be done or who is actually gonna do the work, it's kind of an unknown. Um, but it's, 
writing that doc is actually a huge step towards making this kind of stuff happen. Um, a lot of people sort of assumed that because uh, some members of the Go team have fairly anti-dynamic linking philosophies and that we haven't really said much about it, that Go would never have dynamic linking support. That's not actually true. Um, we're totally interested in doing that. It's just a matter of doing it correctly, which is a very... And I think difficult. nothing's going to happen until the linker is rewritten in, in Go, too. Yeah. So I might just take um, one more question from this, and then we can actually turn over to questions from the audience, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so the question is, with no mechanism to refer to other Go routines, implementing features like supervision trees and killing Go routines requires explicit manual effort. How much should this be addressed by libraries, and how much by changes to the language? Can I give what I think? Yeah. Um, there, there was, um, at, at, at GopherCon earlier this year, there was a pretty strong uh, fe feeling that like, you, you, want to, you want to design your program because it will crash. Like, eventually, something will, will cause your program to stop executing. Um, it could be fat finger, it could be harbor error, it could be a software error, it could be a bug. But the, continuing under the idea that if we just put enough effort into this, that we will achieve complete reliability. It seems that seems un unachievable, um, and so uh, the pe people that want to have uh, cleanup handlers and supervisor trees and things that allow a process which is failing to diagnose its own failure and somehow recover, it seems like trying to do your own internal medicine. Um, you should just be be reborn in a new life. And yeah, I again. think. I mean, th this is <laughs> this is a it's it's obviously a, a really big subject. Mm. Um, but Feel I, free to broach it. <laughs> well, the, you know, there, there's a there's a philosophy of like like let your code crash and recover after the fact and just do that at a you know at a fine granularity and have lots of processes and and um, that's certainly a successful strategy. Like people are successful by by writing code that way. Um, but I think that that doesn't it just doesn't very, fit terribly well with with Go, like as a language, with the the philosophy of how Go is designed, and then I I think there's an equally valid approach where you, within a, within a Unix process, you, like if you want a Go routine not to crash, design for it not to crash. You know when you get errors, either do what you want or return the error or log it or do what's appropriate and when you find bugs, fix the bugs so that it crashes less often and then. When you do run across the occasional inevitable crash that there's nothing you can do about, handle it at a coarser granularity, like the entire Unix process. You can have a supervisor that, that restarts the whole thing, or, or if your entire machine you know, blows up, then you fail over using some, some uh, failure-tolerant distributed algorithm or something. I mean, I suppose in a sense you can flip it around and say, like, well, if it built into the language there were things like addressable go routines and supervisor trees and stuff. Suddenly, you would have to ask yourself the question, oh, what if my go routine crashes? Hey, thread.kill worked out pretty well for Java. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, uh, like one of the things I said in my talk is like I love the fact that the concurrency stuff is so thin, it's such a thin layer that's always there and it's invisible most of the time. Um, so why should my code that's running concurrently have these special properties. Um, I don't know, it seems like a benefit to me. Yeah.